Hello, my name is Michael Todd. I'm here to talk with you today about rib fracture. So what are the uh, factors that are associated with adverse outcomes in patients who have rib fractures? These factors are age greater than 85 year olds, patients who initially present with hypotension, and patients who have complicated rib fractures, usually associated with hemo or pneumothorax, pulmonary contusion, or three or more unilateral rib fractures. In patients who have a number of these risk factors, they are much more likely to develop pneumonia, be transferred to the ICU for hypoxemia, require urgent intubation, or go on to develop ARDS and death. And in fact, approximately 2% of patients who sustain rib fractures go ahead and die. Now, what's associated, why do we worry about rib fractures um, outside of other bony fractures? Well, in a, the fracture in of themselves uh, is usually not particularly dangerous. Uh, however, these fractures tend to be more painful because of the intermittent episodes of respiration that necessarily occur in the underlying thoracic cage these fractures are usually not fixed. And because they're constantly moving, they're constantly tender. This is in contradistinction to other fractures where immobilization uh, immediately results in marked improvement in the patient's pain. This pain is important because <clears throat> the um, development of pain uh, with each breath makes patients splint, and puts them at risk for atelectasis and subsequent pneumonia. As you might expect, the treatment is therefore centered on the patient's pain to help uh, allow adequate alveolar ventilation and minimize the risk of pneumonia. So we worry about rib fractures because it, in, it inhibits patient's uh, breathing and we also worry about rib fractures because of their associated with underlying of their association with underlying injuries in the chest this includes contusion of the lung and in the upper abdomen this includes the liver uh, with right-sided impacts and on the left injuries to the spleen here's a diagram showing the uh, skeletal uh, thorax and you can see the ribs numbered there. You can also see that posteriorly all the ribs are attached to their corresponding vertebral bodies and anteriorly most are connected only indirectly with the sternum. It is this level of flexibility that results in uh, the possibility for ribs to actually crack instead of automatically being displaced like most other fractures. Additionally, it should be noted that on the undersurface of each rib, a neurovascular supply goes to innervate and to provide circulation to the intercostal musculature between each rib. It is through this uh, neurovascular bundle where impulses of pain are refracted first to the spinal cord and then reflected back to the brain for central nervous perception. As you might expect, uh, strategies to block this pain are what we tend to use to enhance uh, ventilation in these injured patients. Now fractures of the ribs can occur uh, at any place, but as the diagram suggests, most of the fractures occur uh, near the origin of the, of the bone, uh, close to its articulation with the uh, spinal uh, column. Number four here represents a, a rib that has been fractured in two places, and contiguous ribs that are similarly associated can result in what is known as a flail segment, which can markedly reduce the uh, ability to ventilate that lung. Many times these patients need to be intubated, and sometimes they require operative fixation of the flail segment. Complications associated with rib fractures include pneumothorax here on this CT of the chest, 
you can clearly uh, see the collapsed lung, the interface between that and free air escaping into the thoracic cavity is demarcated by the points of these arrows. Uh, the pressure in this lung has also uh, developed to a high enough degree to push the usual midline components off to the patient's right. This phenomenon is known as tension, and it can be life-threatening. You can also note the substantial rib fractures in the left thoracic wall, which has caused this condition. Also associated with rib fractures is the development of uh, a hemothorax. This area of gray coloring demarcates and demonstrates uh, the, the placement of blood in this uh, area. This patient is already splinting, as you can see, by uh, collapse of lung tissue on the non-injured lung. Again, this patient also looks like they are demonstrating a small amount of tension as the heart, which is usually just to the left of the patient's center midline, has been pushed over to the right. This patient needs decompression to uh, resume uh, normal intrathoracic pressures and to re-expand this collapsed lung and to evacuate this fluid collection. Notice here the rib fracture. Now, underlying injuries can also occur in patients who sustain rib fractures. Here you can notice a defect within the splenic tissue that is associated with a small splenic laceration and what looks to be a small collection of blood associated with that injury. Also, patients can develop lacerations of the liver. You can see that here clearly identified. And it has resulted in blood accumulating on the other side of the abdomen. Patients can also develop pneumothorax, as we have seen uh, in previous uh, x-rays and is demonstrated here again. And sometimes that air can escape through the uh, thoracic wall entirely, developing in pneumatosis of the skin. And this is manifested on physical exam by palpable crepitants. So what do we do to treat patients who have sustained uncomplicated or complicated rib fractures? Well, in patients who have uncomplicated rib fractures, we encourage them to breathe deeply through the discomfort they have. A young, particularly healthy patient uh, may need no other treatment than incentive spirometry and encouragement to deep breathe associated uh, with non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory medications to control pain. Patients who have underlying COPD often require bronchodilators to improve their ability to ventilate under these circumstances. These patients are already at a compromised level with regard to excretion of uh, developed carbon dioxide gas, and their injuries um, uh, often result in a non-compensatable uh, respiratory acidosis, sometimes requiring intubation. This image demonstrates a uh, classic uh, inpatient incentive spirometer in which inspiration through this mouthpiece results in elevation of this piston within this silo. And we can often demonstrate uh, improvement in the patient's ability to inspire uh, after uh, treatment has begun. Some patients need, um, or many patients need uh, pain medications, especially uh, if they uh, have more than one or two ribs fractured. And we usually try to start with the anti-inflammatories first. This includes the, our old uh, acetaminophen, and uh, we often uh, concomitantly give intravenous uh, or oral uh, ketorolac uh, to help the inflammatory process at the site of the rib fracture. Similarly, ibuprofen can be given and often is given on an outpatient basis. And oftentimes, <clears throat> as the intercostal muscles go into reflexive spasm, we um, alleviate that discomfort uh, with uh, oral cyclobenzaprine. The difficulties uh, with acetaminophen is that it's uh, oftentimes uh, uh, at higher doses associated with uh, 
hepatic toxicity, and thus we uh, uh, oftentimes cannot achieve uh, uh, su uh, sufficient uh, dosages in patients with hepatic failure. And uh, toradol needs to be given uh, sparingly in patients with uh, coagulopathies or in patients uh, who have renal dysfunction. A number of patients, especially those with significant, uh, significantly severe injury, uh, will require not only anti-inflammatory drugs, but systemic narcotics. We try to avoid these medications as if possible because the side effects of the narcotics, as you know, are associated with uh, hypotension, which is obviously adverse, uh, over sedation, and uh, uh, respiratory uh, depression, uh, which is the exact opposite of what we want to obtain in these patients in order to avoid nosocomial pneumonia. As a result, we oftentimes try to block uh, passage of impulses from the site to the central service nervous system by administering either intercostal blockade or epidural analgesia. This allows local control of the pain without the requirement for systemic narcotics. In patients, these uh, procedures are often uh, necessary in, in patients who have multiple rib fractures and who have underlying lung disease. Intercostal blockade, uh, nerve uh, blockade injections can be uh, obtained with long-lasting, uh, long-acting uh, local uh, anesthetic agents that are injected in the subcostal space. The risks associated with this <clears throat> is the possibility of uh, uh, developing pneumothorax in patients who don't ha already have an underlying pneumothorax, though a number of these patients already have a pneumothorax and a chest tube in place, which makes this technique uh, fairly safe. Uh, intercostal blockade usually results in uh, effective uh, anesthesia and analgesia uh, to the uh, appropriately applied segment for up to six to eight hours. Unfortunately, as this medication wears off, uh, intercostal injection is then again required. As an alternative, in patients who don't have spinal injury or who are not, risk, who are not at risk to bleed, who have a number of uh, ipsilateral uh, rib fractures, these patients can be treated uh, with epidural analgesia. This requires the assistance of, a, of a, an anesthesiologist who will then uh, uh, insert an epidural catheter and provide up to three days of epidurally delivered um, long-acting uh, analgesic. Uh, um, during these periods, the patients can breathe freely and require uh, minimal, if any, um, analgesic medications and markedly improve their ability to ventilate. A relatively new technology is the uh, placement of a uh, external rib catheter and through the on-cue pump delivery of these long-term medications uh, on a continuous basis um, employing um, a hybrid technique uh, between the intercostal blockade and the epidural. It does not require insertion into the epidural space and as a result is somewhat uh, uh, safer to administer, but uh, in contradistinction to the uh, epidurally, or excuse me, the uh, intercostally injected uh, anesthetic, uh, this is a continuous delivery of medication, which provides better long-term anesthesia. A single uh, dose of uh, res reservoir full of medication can provide up to two days of continuous relief for the patient. The advantage of this technique is that it can be inserted under sterile conditions in the emergency room and oftentimes in patients who have no other underlying injuries, they can be sent home uh, to return uh, on an every other day uh, basis to refill the reservoir. Thank you very much.